I think as a jewelry department, you guys have a very uh, challenging, uh, you, it's, it's very challenging for you to photograph your artwork. Your artwork has a lot of different facets to it. It's got a lot of different shines and surfaces, some more metallic, some more chrome, some even flat. And so you're going to have to create lighting sources that allow the, the depth and the dimension of your piece to show as well. So I'm just going to move right into a few tricks to start off with. Uh, number one, if you think about the quality of light and the quality of metal, somebody brought me this really elegant uh, piece of jewelry here. Uh, but it's a good piece to um, sort of demonstrate some of the early uh, aspects that I'm talking about. So the way light works photographically is uh, you're either putting light on a subject, actually lighting a subject, or in the case of metal, you're actually using light sources that are going to reflect in the metal and give you the shape and the form. Now, if you've ever gone into, uh, you know, Macy's and, and looked for uh, cookware, and you look at all the pictures of cookware, after you start to study photographically a little bit about what we're doing here today, when you look at Macy's cookware from now on, you're going to see, oh, there's a softbox. Oh, there's a fill card. Sometimes you're even going to see, oh, there's the photographer down inside there. So I want you all to start thinking about lighting and, and how, does, uh, how are other things lit out there. And now that you're going to learn a few of the principles, it's going to help. So one of the first principles I'd like to talk about is the way that say a very shiny metal reflects light. So if I want to show you what this piece of bling looks like, if I just put a single light source on it, what do you see? I'm pretty sure you see a lot of gray and just a few little teeny tiny highlights. So we're going to work on that because uh, the way that silver works and some of the other shiny metals is that you need a larger surface area of light in order to reflect in your piece. In other words, I do have one of these lights back here, as you can see, set up, and it's just a hot light. And it's something that you could buy at uh, an inexpensive photo store. It's called an SV or Smith Victor light. Probably costs you about 10 bucks. Now these are what you use up in your own studios upstairs, but if you wanted to set up your home system, you can with a few simple items. So I brought a couple of things to show you. One. You can go to the hardware store and you could pick up your basic uh, clamp light. Try to get at least 250, maybe 500 watts, which will give you enough power. Now, how many of you have cameras where you can change your white balance? Some. A couple. So these are going to be tungsten lights, meaning that they're going to give off a yellow cast. If you've ever wondered, why are my pictures turning yellow? It's because different light sources are going to be sending different casts. So if I were to use this light today, it would be yellow. And I would have to change my white balance on my camera to a tungsten white balance, which is the little light bulb. And that'll correct for the yellow nature of the, of the clamp light. Now what we have here today are actually studio bulbs. And notice how it looks slightly bluish compared to like a normal light like this. That's because it's actually daylight balance. It says so right on the little glass tube. If you ever see daylight or white balance is measured in Kelvin degrees, I won't go into the whole history of that, but um, 5,500, 5,500 degrees Kelvin is average daylight. So these little light bulbs are actually daylight. So I don't need to change my white balance. I can leave my white balance the same. Makes it a little bit easier because if you're mixing these lights let's say with a window light that's coming in, well then these and the window will be the same color temperature. If you use the old fashioned clamp light, then you're going to have yellow light or blue light. And if you correct for one or the other, it's going to be a little bit off. Um, so broader light source. How did I get that broader light source? Instead of that little tiny light bulb shining on my metal piece, I actually now have this big curtain. It's just a cheap piece of gauzy material you can get at any of the fabric stores. Uh, don't buy silk. Don't spend money on it. It's just to diffuse things, diffuse the light and create a larger light surface. So now there's a larger area that's reflecting or bouncing off of my metal product. Um, we're going to move things around a little bit to get highlights and shadows. We're going to get shape and form. Uh, and I apologize if any of the pieces that I put up, I'm not actually photographing them in the 
proper orientation because I don't know. I didn't even know that the first piece I'm doing was a shoulder piece. <laughs> um, so let me go over a couple of settings. If you do have a camera that allows you to make some changes. So with the quality, um, you don't need to shoot in RAW. Most of you are not using Photoshop to correct your images. So JPEG images are fine. Shoot it in the biggest JPEG image that you can uh, have because you know memory is cheap compared to resolution if you ever wanted to blow your image up a little bit bigger. So uh, the uh, quality is JPEG. And then the other important setting for you is going to be the um, Here's your white balance, it's at daylight, uh, and your color space, sRGB. So that's not the best color space if you're going to make beautiful prints uh, and enlargements, but if you're going on the web, if you're going anywhere in the computer, and prints will be fine, just not as pristine. Um, sRGB is a compressed color space that is designed to look better on the web. The web doesn't have as many millions and trillions of colors as some of our high-end printers do. So the sRGB is how it's going to look right. As long as you get those two things set, you're all right. You're good to go. ISO. You should all do some kind of a test on whatever camera you're using and find out what is the maximum ISO I can go without getting too much noise. In this case here, I'm at 1600, um, which allows me to photograph with, compared to the strobes I normally use, relatively dim light. But I want to make sure I keep my shutter speed up above a 15th or a 30th of a second. Uh, and I want to have it at least f11, because from what I understand, uh, depth of field is very important in the work that you show. Some people use shallow depth of field as, as a way to create interest and a way to direct the, uh, the audience on what exactly to look at. But in your case, I guess the directors and the judges, they want to know what all of your piece looks like. So you want to strive for a very, uh, uh, you know, a pretty extended depth of field. I would recommend if, um, if you have the option, sorry, I guess I put it away. A remote cable release. Um, your camera might jiggle a little bit if you just push the button while you're shooting. Uh, if you don't have a remote cable release, set it on the, uh, the auto timer and then let those seconds click off. That way you're not touching the camera. It'll take your picture and be nice and sharp. So hopefully about F11, maybe a little bit more. Lens choice. Um, Product photography looks best with a slight telephoto lens. In other words, right now I've got a 100 millimeter lens. Uh, a lot of you have zooms that go 70 to 200 or something like that. For product photography, right about 100 millimeters is the best thing. If I grab my 17 millimeter wide angle lens and I'm trying to do a shot of this piece of jewelry, it's going to distort it, right? So the person who's judging your work or evaluating your work is going to have a distorted view of your piece. That's why architects don't like people to use wide angle lenses uh, when they're photographing their buildings because of all the distortion. That's not what I designed. That's not what I intended for this piece to look like. So um, about a 80 to 100 millimeters. Now, if you only have a 50, that'll work. But if it's an ideal world. Now, this lens that I'm using today is also uh, uh, referred to as a macro lens. It means that I can come in and get extra close up. I thought some of you might bring, uh, be bringing me in little rings or little tiny pieces. And so I've got the macro in case we need to get really close. That's different than the zoom. Zoom means that you change the, uh, the, uh, perspective, the, the focal length from one focal length to another. That's what a zoom means. I'm talking about um, uh, getting in really close. And so I'm not zooming in by moving. I'm zooming in by moving my camera. Okay. So what I've done here is I've got this piece. And the piece is basically, like I said, a shoulder piece of some kind. And I've created a tent with this lighting here. And then I use just a piece of foam core. It could be a mat board. By the way, this could be a sheet that you have at home. Uh, make sure it's white and not even slightly aged. <laughs> uh, it needs to be white. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but a sheet sometimes is a little bit too thick. I mean, you start getting into the high-end thread counts, and it's very dense. So you lose the power of your light source. So if I'm only using a 200-watt bulb and I use a really thick sheet, I've eliminated a stop or two. That's why this stuff here, you can see how you know, my hand 
it's, it's about that shear. I wish I knew the actual name of it, but I don't. This is a piece of white foam core. You could use matte board that you get at Flax or any of the other stores. So now what I've done is I've made this little tent here where I've got the fill card closed in on one side, and I've got the light over here. And if we go back to my test shot as I was working on this earlier, there we go. So now notice, I wish I had a pointer. <laughs> notice how I've got a large light surface that's reflecting off the various pieces of metal. You can also see that this particular metal, I'm not sure what it is, um, this particular piece of metal has, uh, obviously when it goes into the heat, it sort of patinas a little bit, right? So we want to see that patina. We want to see this variation of colors in through here. We also want to see a little bit of shadow on the bottom, not a lot. We don't want to distract you with all kinds of shadows. I'm using a white background, and basically it's just designed to be a very clean surface without um, uh, imposing any sort of narrative. A black background might give you a different narrative than a white background. Um, and the same goes for lighting, you know. Hard light normally gives you a little bit more tension, and uh, soft light is a softer look. Well, also, soft light feels a little bit more natural. It takes the photographer out of it, it takes the light out of it, and it really will have your viewer focusing on just your jewelry. And I think that's the part that we really want everyone to look at, right? We don't want them to look at shadows. So this piece I also moved so that this one area in the very front, it's got like a little area of silver in there. So I want that to light up as silver to demonstrate that it's different than the bronzy, copper, uh, whatever type of metal it is. I've, I'm a photographer. I don't study jewelry a lot. Um, so do you guys see how this works? You put a tent around, you've got a larger light source, and we end up with a nicer piece. All right, well, let's try our ugly piece of bling that we had before. Um, you saw how it looked when I shined just the light on it. It was mostly gray. Now I'm going to put it in the same spot with this other piece here. Okay. Now, when photographing chrome, your objective is to have <clears throat> highlight areas that are almost white, uh, fill areas. As you notice, the fill card and the background is helping to fill this piece and give it some shape. And also, my larger light source is bouncing around inside this phony uh, gem. So I get shape, I get detail, and uh, a pretty good representation of exactly what this is. Not that it's anything very attractive, but we at least now know what it is. So chrome is one of the more challenging. If it's an object that's more cylindrical, like um, cap of a makeup or something like that, you want to use a, a soft light on one side, a fill light on the other side, and you'll get a silver line, a gray line, and a black line. That tells your brain, oh, that's chrome, not a white. If it's too white, it might be white bling. So the other gives us that sense. So let's pick something a little bit different. I wanted to bring up, actually, while I'm at it, I wanted to bring up one of the pieces that I'm not going to photograph today uh, because it has a slightly different challenge. Now, this piece is filled, obviously, with LED lights, right? The LED lights change. They go into multiple colors. So I would probably check with the artist, is there a place that you could freeze this? in its cycle? The answer may be yes or no, I don't know, but that's the first question I would ask. Well, how do you want it frozen? Do you want it frozen in the multicolors? Do you want it frozen in all one color? <clears throat> if you can't, then we're just going to have to shoot it when we get it. Now, if I were to put this in that same tent so I could see the metal and what the metal looks like, which is a very important part of the shot, right? Well, when the camera goes off, that white light that's lighting our metal is going to cancel out the LEDs. The LEDs look bright in a dark room, but they're not going to be bright in this tent that I've created. So what I would do with this shot is you need to control the room and, and have a black room. In other words, 
you open the camera, you take the picture once, and then you turn off your light, and then you take the picture again for just the LEDs, which is going to be a different exposure, and then you merge the two together later. If the camera's on a tripod and it stays in exactly the same place, your merge is very simple. And if any of you have friends that know Photoshop, they could help you out with that really easily. So that's with this guy here. We're not going to photograph him. Uh, but let's talk about some other objects that might have a slightly different reflectance. This little piece right here, it's kind of interesting. It looks almost black, right? Or, or dark, dark gray. But it's a shiny material. So we want you, you want the viewer that's evaluating this to understand that it's a shiny material. So the same thing applies. We'll have some highlights and some shadows. And we'll see how we do on our exposure for the first try. All right. There we have our piece. So again, if this was just that light, a small pinpoint light source, this would be totally black, and you would get just a few little teeny tiny highlights. But instead, with all of this light that I have here, including the fill from the fill card right over there, uh, this down here is from the white paper and it's bouncing back up. So once you begin to notice what all of your different light sources are doing, then you could begin to move them around to highlight specific areas of your piece that you want to. Maybe this fill card would look better coming from a different place. Maybe this fill card should be coming from the front. And I'll get it in even a little bit closer. Or, as an example, that's with the fill card. Now I notice the fill card is showing up a lot more in here and in here. Giving, so we want depth and dimension. There's no question about that. Maybe you don't want that kind of depth and dimension. Maybe we're going to move our fill card out to the left even farther. <clears throat> now you'll notice how the side's a lot darker. So let me go back. So fill card far away, you get very dark black areas. Fill card in closer. See just the little difference? Now, when I move the fill card out, it allowed some of this tungsten light to sneak in, and that's why it's got that orange cast. You'd want to turn off on any light in the room that's not part of your photo shoot. We couldn't do it today, obviously, because uh, we're on live. Uh, and then here was the beginning fill card, kind of in the, in the halfway in between those two. So beginning, and that's the max. Now, how many of you know this piece? A few. Which one do you like the best? The lots of fill or the little fill? This one. Better than this one, right? Yes. Too black. Yes. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. That's where I brought it around front. So my point is, don't just make your tent and leave it there. The idea that you're building your shot each time, you're experimenting with your shot, you're moving cards around, maybe you're moving your lights around, maybe you're adding another light in order to create some little specular highlights. Um, so two lights, a diffusion card, or a diffusion panel, and a fill card is pretty much all you need. And then now you're going to use the skills to kind of build on that. All right, let's move this guy out of the way. Is it a pin? Yeah? Cool. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to challenge myself to go deep here. Acrylic, some with silver, some clear. So we're going to keep our tent because I think that's going to be the best choice. And I'm going to try to show, like I said, I don't know its normal orientation. That should help a little bit there.
It's a little bright. So this is a piece that I might consider shooting on black. I understand that you guys have the option of either going with black or white, and that most of the juried panels would rather see it on white. But there's certain items that I feel white may not be the best choice. Let me try sh shooting one just a little bit darker. Yeah. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. These facets up here, it's pretty obvious that they're clear. So it gives you an idea that this is a mixture of clear pieces, and then these pieces down here are mirrored. So you notice where the mirrored piece reflects directly on our big card, our big sheet. Yes? Sometimes use the gray sheet that goes Okay, that would help too. Yeah. But I just wanted everyone to know that these, are, these aren't all clear plastic pieces. Some are chrome pieces and some are regular uh, plastic. I see now that this is also a pin, which means it should have been facing forward, but still gives us the idea. So you notice how the challenge is going to vary uh, between all of your different pieces. Um, but this setup, what I'm trying to, what I'm setting up here, is a setup that will be very neutral. It will allow you to move things in and out and work pretty smoothly. Okay, now I got this little pendulum thing. What do we need to know about the pendulum thing? We need to know that it's patinaed metal on top. We need to know that it looks like there's some brass in the, on the stands. And the base looks like it's wood. So we've got a lot of different materials, right? So let's see if our... I'm going to lower the camera just a little bit so we can see more that it's a little tower. Normally I would switch this to a vertical, but I'm just going to go ahead and get it here. Okay. Geez, is it supposed to be crooked like that? <laughs> I was worried that I kind of, it was wiggly. No, it's pretty tight. Okay, I'm not going to mess with it then. So, this is fantastic. I didn't even know before I shot this picture that there were these little textures up in here until just now. So, it's the lighting on that top surface that allows some contrast between the highlights and the shadows. So it gives us these little characters. Um, notice how our poles here have highlights on one side and fill card on the other side. So let me do one where I take the fill card out completely. Okay, if I go back one with the fill card, without. Now you're looking at this side of these poles, and watch what happens. It turns into that. <laughs> <laughs> Oop, don't need that. Okay, sorry guys. There we go. Now, don't need the raw. Okay. With fill, without. With fill, without. Now, don't tell me you don't notice a difference. I'm going to show you areas where you should notice it. Look at right here. With the fill, without the fill. Right? So it's just a piece of foam core that is helping to give us this depth and dimension. Okay, what about up on top? Without the fill, this whole side goes dark. With the fill, we get the detail without the fill. So you're coming in here today thinking, oh my God, he's going to teach us this amazing lighting and all these techniques and all this special lighting equipment, 
And what do I spend my time talking about the most? A piece of foam core. But it's that subtlety. It's not that I'm giving you the right tools. What I'm hoping to do is that I'm giving you that vision so you see the difference of whether it's lit and not lit. And that's the important part. As long as you could see it, then you can create it with minimal stuff. You don't have to buy a $5,000 camera. OK, so what else did we notice with this little pendulum? Let's go back to the fill side, because it looks so much better. I guess that was the fill side. Um, <clears throat> we can see that it's small and intricate. Now, big peeve of mine, product photography, it will be a peeve of your judge and jurors and directors who are viewing this. This has got white dust all over it. You know, it's been up on the shelf for a while. Dust has settled. And so what does that make it look like? It, make, it makes it look like you, the artist, are not paying attention to detail. That you're not so proud of your piece that you have make sure that it is perfectly cleaned and perfectly polished. If this was my piece, just because I'm a little uh, graphically, uh, I need things to be aligned and upright. So I would twist this around and make sure everything lined up just right, unless my pro this is, that's a subjective opinion, right? I think it should be that way. Maybe you're like, oh no, this is my piece and I meant it to be kind of whimsical and looking cartoonish. Hopefully that's not a, a bad thing to say. <laughs> um, so you, anyway, you get my point. Now let's play with something a little bit different. I saw, so here I came in today thinking metal. And what do I find? This guy. Well, that's definitely not metal, but it's super cool. And it's going to work out perfectly in our little setup here. Because the light, and I'm going to try to straighten it out a little bit so we know what it looks like. The light is going to come down and bounce off this white surface and come back through our piece. So there will be some areas where we can see our fill cards and other lighting. Uh, and this one is going to look better to come back up again. OK. There we have it. So I'm seeing, so with, with glass, anything that's glass or anything that's plastic, if you shine light through it, where the glass is thicker, it'll get darker. And where the glass is thinner, it'll be more the color that you're exposing for. So again, with my chopsticks in hand, notice how all the edges are a little bit thicker. And they really give you that plastic look because they're black. And it gives you the dimension. As it curves around, it gets darker up here. And when it overlaps, ooh, look at that screw. You get that nice metallic reflection on the screw as well. So this thing, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, wow, plastic. I'm coming here for metal. But with this setup, it works. Now, what if I were to turn it around the other direction so that more of the front is going to be hit with the highlight? So that's going to give you a different look. So I'm still getting that translucent quality. There's that screw having the fill card coming into it. Now, but my key light is also being reflected in the piece. And that's telling our viewer that this is very shiny plastic. So again, you decide whether you like the shiny reflection or not. How many of you can see the difference? Good. That means it's working. You're starting to see light. Now, another attention to detail. I would do everything I possibly could to get a piece of paper that doesn't have wrinkles in it. Again, it's these little things that might be the difference of getting into a show or getting into uh, the spring show, much less. One of my favorite sections to go to in the spring show is all the jewelry making and the jewelry design. I really enjoy that. Um, let's try one more thing. 
let's add even more reflected materials into this. I'm bringing my fill card in. Remember, 50 cent piece of foam core. Uh-oh, I jiggled. OK, uh, with the front light and more fill light, there is without the side fill light. With the side, let me do one. I can't look at that. There we go. Much better. Now, how many of you agree that having a little bit of this screw showed up bright on one side, fading to the metal? That happened when I moved the fill card in closer. So now I get this idea that it's plastic, that the screw's metallic, and the whole shape of it. But I might not like all of that stuff. I honestly, and again, we're talking subjective, I might like going all the way back to where I can't see any light reflecting in my piece, and it's only about my piece. So sometimes you need to have light, and sometimes you might, um, the light might take away from the purity of your piece. OK, I can pick up another thing. I've, I've covered most of the surfaces. Definitely want to open it up for questions. I've been saving what I think might be the most challenging for last. So what do we have here? We have shiny metal, and we have clear plastic. And there's not one flat surface on this whole piece. It, there's facets and surfaces all over the place. So I'm just going to put it right here in the middle. It's even got its own mind of, oh, that's. All right. It's supposed to be symmetrical, I'm sure. This is a necklace, right? Some kind of a piece. All right, let me move this out of the way. So, it's a little bit bright. I would turn it down, which I'll do. And I'm getting some of the, uh... so if it's too wide, the, the clear plastic gets blown out. That's better. So now I've got these shapes up here. I can see that there's clear plastic, and I can see that there's a nice metallic structure underneath there. Now I know this is not the proper orientation, that this should be straight and very symmetrical and, and lit, but I'm kind of just working on, if I were to spend another half an hour on this one piece, I could move things around, maybe have a different fill card coming from above uh, and picking up different facets. Maybe this is a good one for that gray uh, background as well, the graded gray background. OK. This is kind of fun. I've got my mannequin. Now again, I should switch to vertical. But I really want to just focus on the piece. Now I can already see through looking through the camera that one of the pieces appears to be more reflective than the others. I need a trusty fill card holder. Right there. That's good. Thank you. To a little bit brighter. Can you move that in even a little bit closer? 
keep going. Okay, good. All right. Now, oh gosh, dirt, 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 dirt. So, <clears throat> mannequins, you know, we need a lint brush if we're going to use a mannequin. Thank you. Um, so, what we've got, I look at this now and I realize, oh, this is wood. This is pieces of wood, right? So, we want to see that detail. We want to see the grain of the wood. And I want to show that it's hooked together by these brass or copper pins. I want to see that these beads are round. Notice how I still have the highlight on that bead. Um, I would probably have styled it, you know, put a little bit more time styling it so it was more symmetrical. But this area here, fantastic, showing us that it's a real wood piece. And it shows us also that it's a shiny wood piece because it's pretty reflective here and not as reflective there. Had I spent a little bit more time on that, I probably would have used a bigger fill card to make sure that more of that reflected light comes in. Um, or you could turn your mannequin even more into the light and maybe the goal is to have more of it reflected. And this is without a fill card. How about my trusty fill card holder? And bring it around front a little bit more, a little bit closer. Oh, yeah. Good. OK, same shot. But I rotated the mannequin towards the light. Now, if I look back one, <clears throat> see how here it gets a little bit dark? Rotate it into the light. This is what I was concerned about earlier. So this is where you start moving things like within an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. Or maybe you need to literally put underneath here, roll up some tape and put a piece something underneath here so that you change how it's reflecting. So it's little details that you can build on these shots. You can, you can um, continually to continue to improve it by recognizing, okay, what's causing that highlight? Oh, well, that's my big light over here. Well, what do I move? Do I move the mannequin overall? Do I move the little piece of material so that it's not reflecting? If that wasn't reflecting directly into the light, you know, maybe it just meant that I needed to put something underneath here and lift it up a little bit so that it's the same reflectance as all these others. It still says wood. We've got nice highlights here. The brass still looks good or copper. Chain looks great. So it's just this one piece. So I would work on that. The one before that, that's a little bit better when it comes to reflectance. So maybe I would keep the light and the mannequin where it is and work on getting in some more light here. All right, well, that is a good example of the surfaces that we have had um, that, that are up here. And it's pretty much a good example of almost every type of surface that you're going to have working with uh, in your club. And uh, so we have uh, plastic, shiny plastic. We've got metal, patina metal, shiny metal. We've had um, wood with metal. Uh, we've had just about everything today. And the, the good thing, the beauty of it, this tent stays exactly the same. Now I'm moving pieces of it around, but the actual shape of the tent stays the same. So now I've got pieces, JPEG files in sRGB. I'm ready to dump them onto my site on the web. Um, I can make prints. I can send them to, to jury, uh, jurors uh, for submissions and shows. And um, I'm good to go. My files are all here. And uh, you know anything you need, you're ready. So I hope, in conclusion, that what you learned today was not that I used a piece of silk and a white piece of paper and a piece of foam core. What I'm hoping what you get from this is that you are now a little bit more acute at how you see light, how you see light reflecting off of things. Um, <clears throat> even in your home, with a window light and a piece of material in front of that, you can create beautiful light as long as you could see it. But if you can't see it, then it's going to be an ugly picture no matter what. Chances are you could do great shots like this with your cell phone. Some, some of you are, will, will need to, because that's the only camera you have. You're investing in copper and gold and silver, and you don't have money for a camera. I don't know. Anyway, I'd love, it, uh, I'd love to open up for any questions that you might have, uh, basically about what kind of equipment, where to go, how, how would I light this, or how would I light that? Try me. 
So uh, a great entry level camera uh, is the Rebel XT567, whatever, that's a Canon. Um, I say that because I'm familiar with Canons. Uh, there's a Nikon equivalent, so I'm not brand sensitive. I just know the numbers better on Canon because that's what I have. Uh, but the Nikon equivalent would be about the same. A newer camera, I'll tell you the advantage of getting a newer camera. Uh, in the last seven to 10 years, uh, the, the scientists, the technology of your ISO and noise reduction has improved dramatically. I mean, this camera here, this is a 5D Mark II, which is a semi-professional camera, but it's eight or nine years old. And I can't get away with much more than 1600 ISO on this thing without starting to see noise. Some of the new ones, even the new Rebels, and you can go up to 3200 and still barely see it. The other trend, uh, expensive trend, but the other trend is the mirrorless cameras, the little Sonys and, and uh, Leicas, of course. But basically, um, what makes a DSLR is the fact that there's a mirror inside here. And the reason that I could see what's exactly go through my lens is because the mirror sends it up to the prism up top, and so I see what's exactly in the lens. But that mirror is kind of a clumsy operation, right? So they figured out a way to get rid of that mirror by putting a second LCD screen up in your view piece. So now I don't have a mirror, but I can still see exactly what's shining through my camera. Some of those that Sony's doing, you can have ISOs up to 6,000 ISO. 60, well, I mean, they go way high, but I mean, realistically, four, five, 6,000 would be the way to go. So macro. Macro means that its ability to focus on something really close, like up to an inch or two away. Um, macro lenses uh, <clears throat> are sometimes fixed, but not always. So you still have the ability to zoom in and out as well, but it'll just give you that choice of photographing. So if your jewelry is small, you may want to think about a macro lens. Any more questions? Good question, uh, because I sometimes breeze over stuff because you know maybe I don't verbalize every time, oh, I'm changing my f-stop. But yes, she said, when I made it brighter, was I changing the f-stop? That's what I changed to make it brighter. When I made it darker, though, I changed my shutter speed. Because the faster my shutter speed can go, the less chance there is of blur. So I'm not going to slow down my shutter speed to make it brighter. I'm going to use my f-stop. But if I have the extra, if it's too bright, then I'm going to make my shutter speed faster so I don't have shake. What's the slowest shutter speed uh, that you should run? And so if you're hand holding it, if you don't have a tripod, the slowest should be a 30th or, or a 60th of a second. That's why I recommend getting the tripod. <coughs> Excuse me. The tripod stabilizes the camera. So now I can go down as slow as I want. I can go down, let's say I have a piece and I need massive depth of field. I've got to shoot it at f16 because I want all of my piece to be in focus. Well, if I shoot at f16, I might be all the way down to a half a second exposure. But if I'm on a tripod, it doesn't matter. As long as you have your remote shutter release or you use the timer because you don't want to be pushing that button for a 30th, um, uh, half a second, because you're going to move your camera. And you guys saw one of the pictures of what happened when I moved the camera. So um, if you don't have a remote, just set it on the 10 second uh, auto timer as if you're going to run around and, and jump in. And then that way when the camera clicks, no one's touching it. Well, the light source, if I moved it farther away or closer, it would change my exposure. And I don't, I've got it as close as I can because I don't want to lose it. <coughs> Excuse me. She asked why I was moving the camera back and forth and why I was moving the fill card back and forth, but why didn't I move the light? I wanted as much light as I could get. So once I created this larger source of light, I didn't need to move it anymore. It was stabilized. Now, why did I move the camera back and forth? Because I'm using a 100 millimeter macro lens that's fixed 100 millimeter. Didn't have a zoom. So... I want you all to pretend like if you do have a camera that'll let you go to 100 millimeters, 70 to 200 or something, put it on 100 and leave it there. Break that habit of zooming in order to change your distance because you want the right focal length to make your product look as good as possible, not zooming it out to 17 and distorting the heck out of it, it won't look right. So that's why I was moving in and out. Thank you. So even if it's a bigger, 
patina piece of brass, you would still keep the light source where it is. Yeah, and I would get a nice highlight, and then I would get a darker area in the middle where the camera is, and then I would get a nice fill light from my card. So you would understand that it is definitely shiny brass, you said, brass, um, because I've got a white area, a grayish area, and then this would create sort of the brassy color, where it's just a fill card. So you'd get that sense of, oh, this is not a matte piece, this is a shiny piece. But the light can stay the same. I think if you used this similar, because gold leaf comes on and it's never perfectly smooth like a chrome, but it's got variations, if you were to use this exact same setup, you would get goldy highlights and then a little bit less gold uh, shadows, but it would still look shiny and gold. So that's a good question. And I'll use this little pendulum guy. You know, when we were photographing, say, this piece, it kind of made sense to sort of come down on it uh, three quarters so that you got a sense of its shape uh, and its dimension. Now, when I, move <clears throat> when I move to this piece from the camera in the same condition, uh, position, I was looking down at the top and emphasizing the top of it where it feels like it's a little water tower, so I wanted to kind of peek down into it. So I lowered the camera so that I was getting more of that sense that I was peeking into it rather than just looking down on a, on a toy. So it's just the kind of like looking at the piece and deciding what's going to give you the best angle. Um, this guy kind of looked cool, not looking straight down at it, but looking from the side. And then we got some nice overlapping of the plastic and you can see it's how clear it is. Uh, so it came, it was better to come down a little bit than to look straight down at it. So I think that you, the artist, is going to have the best answer to that question. How do you want your jewelry to be looked at? How do you want it to be viewed? It's not an answer of like, oh, the photographer says always look down at three quarters. No, you're the boss. You get to decide how you want it to look. What is your, like when I made this piece, what is the most, uh, say recognizable that makes this piece what it is and that it's mine and then you feature that you're taking a three-dimensional object that you have viewed upside down and around and a hundred different times and let's say you're required to only send in one picture that best represents that piece so when you make that transition from a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional flat image, whether it's on a piece of paper or on an L LCD screen, that is gonna, it's going to change a little bit. And sometimes you can't even see that change when you're looking through your camera. Sometimes your eye is still creating that dimension. So I would shoot all of your pieces three, four, five different ways and then find out what looks the best after it's converted to two-dimensional. And you might be surprised that it's not the one that you originally thought it was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen people that will do like a, a grid, you know, like six pictures that show all different angles and stuff. It all depends on what the requirement is for, um, you know, you sending it in. He has a piece that's a birdcage with a porcelain bird on the inside. And he asked, how does he make the metal look shiny and light the bird and have the bird look right? Um, and he has it here. So as I, as I talk through it, um, you can bring it on up. So what I would do, though, basically, um, I would start with the exact same setup as I have. I would start with the, uh, the large light source. It's going to make the metal look shiny. But the porcelain bird down inside that cage might not be lit well enough. We might need to kick a little extra light in. So that's the time when I might grab my second light source and I might send it in kind of from underneath a little bit. In other words, get it up into that cage. Now, this is all assuming that I know exactly what his piece looks like. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
How do you wear it? Okay, so the only part of his question that he didn't mention was that oops, the metal is black. <laughs> and the birds are inside. So I'm not going to go full on and shoot it. We're pretty much out of, out of time. But what I want you to think about, when, uh, when I was asked about how do you decide whether to look from above something or below something, this is a perfect example of an image that I don't want to shoot from above because then I'm positively not going to see the elements inside. So I'm going to definitely bring my camera down here and now I can see that there's little artifacts inside. So I've got, again, the nice shiny highlight coming on the highlight side. This fill card is going to pick up a lot of light on the little things inside and you probably <coughs> would have to try a few different exposures. How bright can I make the little porcelain birds inside without making the black look too bright? So it's going to be a variety of like, how far can I go? I better open my f-stop and make it brighter, make it brighter. But now the black doesn't look black anymore, so I'll go to the one before. So again, it's that process of you sort of building your shots and working on your shots. Don't use a scanner. Your resolution. Um, you know, any decent DSLR is going to have a better resolution, more pixels. A scanner is usually to make a reasonable facsimile of something, but not necessarily to be super accurate. Now, I might be a little out of date with modern scanners, uh, but I don't know if modern scanners have caught up with the technology of our DSLRs today. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That one there? Yeah. The big one? Yeah. Yep. And if you want to prop it up, what are some of the tricks you can use? Okay. I'm going to get some blocks of wood and cover. She asked me for this particular necklace. <clears throat> if you were to lay it out flat, what kind of tricks would you use? So I would definitely work with styling cues, not to try to just make it round. I want to figure out ways to give it a little bit more dimension. So I'm going to get wooden blocks, and I'm going to cover them with the same white paper. And maybe I'm going to make a stairway of you know, cascaded white blocks so that it feels like this is sort of coming down over the shoulders and then spread out in the front. So any way that you could make it feel a little bit more organic rather than just, oh, I'm faithfully documenting my piece, um, that would be my approach to it. Now, I don't know. If I'm giving wrong advice, does the piece? No, that's good advice. OK, so make, you have to show what your piece is made of. You have to show what its narrative is, what its contents, what are you trying to get emotionally. But sometimes you, can't, you don't need to just plop it out there. Give it some style. Give it some edge. Notice that's a technical word, plop it out there. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the, the lesson in seeing light. And again, I'm repeating myself, but that's the most important thing today. Inexpensive, inexpensive pieces of equipment can be used to make very beautiful shots, as long as you could see it. So keep looking. Um, anytime you're about to photograph something, uh, Google, how do I photograph glass? How do I photograph metal? Uh, you don't even have to say, how do I have to? Just say, photographing metal. And when it, you'll see hundreds of images will pop up, and you, and you, hopefully after today, will be like, oh yeah, there's that big softbox, or this is what would also be called a softbox. Oh yeah, there's the fill card on that side. Okay, that's a good idea. But it's got some little tiny sparkles. What's he, what's he or she done there? Oh, well, he has a little catch light, or she, um, and created like little sparkles. So you're going to see the stuff, and then you'll be able to use those ideas further. Yay. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank all of you for taking the time. I really appreciate it.